today we start uh, a unit on magnetism. So here are some experimental facts, things that were just discovered over the course of really thousands of years as people played around with stuff. Um, some pieces of metal attract other pieces of metal even when they're uncharged. If you take one of those pieces of metal oops, and float it in, say, with on a piece of cork, it'll spin so that one end points northward always. We call such a device a compass. The end that is pointing towards the north is called, logically enough, the north pole, and the other end is the south pole of that compass. And then a compass brought near some other magnet will align with its poles. So left alone, the needle flows over like this, but if we bring a magnet near a compass, the, um, the unlike ones attract each other. All right, so south, south is attracted to north. Etc. This is sort of a universal pictograph for a compass, the idea being it's sort of floating on this little spinner thing and can spin around. And for reasons that have escaped me, but historically and universally, when we draw magnets, we shade the northern pole red. Uh, don't know why, but everyone always says, seems to do that. Some more empir empirical facts. These are things, again, that are observed. They're not coming from anywhere. They've just been observed. The north pole of one magnet will repel the north pole of a second magnet, but attract the south pole. And likewise, the south poles will repel each other but be attracted to the north pole. And second, cutting a magnet in two produces two new magnets, each one weaker than the one before, but still distinctly magnetic and with their own poles. In other words, and this is important, we get north and south pole, and this becomes a north and south pole. We don't get a pure north pole and a pure south pole. These things never happen. This is what would be called a monopole, and they don't seem to exist. Magnets can pick up some objects, like paper clips, but not, uh, but not most objects, such as glass or copper or aluminum or plastic. Notice that some of the things that can't be picked up are, in fact, metals. So it's not just like you can pick up metals, only some metals. A magnet brought near an electroscope does not induce charge in it. That's really very important. When you bring a uh, magnet that you haven't otherwise put charge on, so you say ground the magnet and then you walk it over to an electroscope, it does not deflect the leaves. And then finally, a charge rod brought near a magnet might induce a weak polarization, but only because the magnet is metal. It doesn't seem to have any strong uh, attractions based on charges. What does all that mean? Here are some implications. One, magnetism is long-ranged. You don't have to have things touching, they can just be near each other. Two, magnetism is not electricity, although later we'll see that they are related. And two, there are two types of poles, just like there are two types of charge, but it's not the same thing. All magnetics, all magnets that we encounter are magnetic dipoles. There's always a north and a south. Splitting a dipole forms new dipoles. There are no magnetic monopoles. In our universe, we have never encountered them, and we have good reason to think that they don't exist. We will describe the effect of magnets analogously to how we did with charge. We'll say a magnet creates a zone of influence called its magnetic field. Another magnet in that field will feel the influence of the first. Just as an electric dipole feels a torque tending to align the dipole with the electric field, we'll define the direction of the magnetic fields as, as that with which a compass needle will tend to align. In other words, we'll say that magnetic fields produce torques on compass dipoles the way that electric fields produce force on electric dipoles. The magnet rotates so that the north end points in the direction of the field. Right. Why do we use electric dipoles? Because there aren't any magnetic monopoles, so we can't reason from what happens to charges because there's no equivalent magnetic charge. Um, instead, we say that the magnetic field is the thing that the compass will line up with, with the north pointing in the direction that the field's pointing. By nearly universal convention, we denote the magnetic field as B, and we'll often just talk about the B field instead of the magnetic field. Why do we pick B? As usual, historical accident. Uh, when James Clerk Maxwell, a seminal figure in electrodynamics, was laying out his major work, he listed the vectors he'd be using, starting from A and going A, B, C, and so on, all the way to H. But in modern notation, only the A, B, and H survive. We don't use his C or his D, really, or anything like, like that. They just kind of fell away. The units for B will have to wait until we've got some force law to compare to. We can use iron filings to demonstrate the field around a magnet. The small bits of iron will temporarily magnetize and line up with the field. Notice that the compasses tell us the field flows from the North Pole to the South Pole. All right, we've got this little image up here to look at. So the idea is that these little bits of iron get magnetized and then spin to a line, and so they kind of map out where the field is, and then they've put these compasses in the vision field so we can see, because remember that the direction of a magnetic field is along the direction the North is pointing, so like that, 
or like that, or like that, or like that. And so we see that these things must be doing something like this. As with electric fields, we can use either a map of, of field vectors, which is shown off here to the left, or the field lines as shown below. And also like electric field, we'll generally f talk about field lines and not so much maps of field vectors. And here we say the direction of the magnetic field at any point is tangent to the field line. They're drawn closer together where the field is stronger. And uh, every magnetic field leaves the magnet at the North Pole and heads into the South Pole. All right, the big book of field diagrams. So there are a few configurations whose fields are worth knowing. This is things that you're going to want to recognize. I don't know if you have to memorize them, but you want to recognize it. So the first is a single bar magnet, and you do want to know this one. All right, this is what we call a magnetic dipole moment coming from good old traditional uh, cheap magnetic field ma magnetic bar here, and we get something like this. All right, if we're far away, we get the, the things I've been drawing. When we're in closer, we see it's a little bit more complicated in the middle here, but not too bad. If we put two bar magnets uh, such that they are aligned, we can see that the field points smoothly in, although we still get these weird fringing effects like this. Um, if they're opposed, like north versus north, we can see that the fields push on each other, and we can almost see the pressure here between them because they want to zero out here. Note the field lines can start on one magnet and end on the other. That's not a big deal. And here, notice how sharply the magnetic field lines bend to avoid the northern pole. All right, the refrigerator magnet, like you might slap on your refrigerator, is a series of alternating uh, magnetic fields like this. They kind of look like this, uh, as if they were like long U-shaped magnets. And so their field is sort of constrained. It's designed to be mostly on one side and sort of this weird circular thing going on here. There are these field films that contain magnetic filings, and so we can see how the field sort of looks in here where we get sharp field uh, we get some sharp fields and then places of low field. Turns out the Earth is heavily magnetic. In fact, we used that at the very start by saying compass mo compasses will line up with the to point towards the north. Um, it's coming from the fact that the Earth's core is, is both iron and molten. So as the Earth spins, we get some current, which we'll see later is where we can get magnetic field from. Notice the kind of weirdness in the ling linguistics here. Because compasses point north towards the north, but poles are attracted to the other pole, it must be that the north pole of the Earth is a south magnetic pole. Yeah, that was probably a bad choice of notation, but we got stuck with it. The north geographic pole is the south magnetic pole. Also, it doesn't quite line up with the geographic pole. The geographic pole is the, uh, the pole around which the Earth seems to spin, and the magnetic poles drift a little bit from that. And every once in a while, they'll actually even flip once in a while. Every 22,000 years or so, they'll flip direction. Um, Near the pole, the field is tipped at a very large angle because it's heading into the Earth. But near the equator or lower down, the field is almost parallel to the surface of the Earth. Here's an impression of Jupiter's magnetic field. It's wackier than ours. Um, it's got a lot, Jupiter is spinning really fast and has metallic hy hydrogen at the core, we think, and generates very strong, very weird fields out here. Um, anyway, cool picture. It doesn't really have a lot of quantitative information in it, but the... The Galilean moons orbit close to within these things, and that creates effects we'll talk about later. And the sun also has a, a magnetic field. In fact, it's hugely strong compared to the Earth's. Um, and so you get, uh, since the, Earth is, the sun is made of ionized plasma to begin with, the charges will get trapped on these field lines and follow them so they can be seen in their polarization. And we can see, uh, actually, these are actual field lines you can see piping out of the sun. Um, these are not illustrations added in. These are the actual images. Just like here, we can see a field line looping out of the sun. And we'll talk a little bit later about this impact, but there's some interesting physics that goes on in the sun because it's a plasma with a strong magnetic field. All right. A compass is placed next to a bar magnet as shown. Which figure shows the correct alignment of the compass? Remember again, for a bar magnet, the, field, the dipole field looks something like leaves the North Pole, which I guess we should mark like this and heads into the South Pole. So we should look for, and the direction tangent tells us which way the, comp the North would point. So it looks pretty clearly the North Pole would point uh, opposite and along. It would point like that. And there we are. There's a picture again of the field just so you can see it from before.